Here we're going to look at a classic integral problem from Calculus 2, and we're going to solve it three different ways. So our goal is to evaluate the indefinite integral of the square root of 1 plus x squared. We're going to use Euler substitution first, hyperbolic substitution second, and then the technique that's usually taught in a Calculus 2 class, and that is trigonometric substitution last. Okay, so let's jump into this Euler substitution first. So what we wanna do in this case is let u equal x plus the square root of one plus x squared. So it kinda of seems like that comes out of nowhere, but if you know what the antiderivative is, that is if you know what the answer is, you'll see that something like this shows up in the solution. And so that means that this is a nice source for our substitution. And that might seem a little cheaty, and I will admit that it kind of is, but needless to say, this substitution is pretty nice. Okay, so notice that that tells us that u minus x equals the square root of one plus x squared. Now we can square both sides. That's gonna tell us that u minus x quantity squared is one plus x squared. We can multiply out this left-hand side and that's gonna give us u squared minus two ux plus x squared equals one plus x squared. Now we're actually in a really good position because we can cancel out this x squared with this x squared and then solve for x. And so not only will we have u in terms of x, but we'll have x in terms of u. So let's see what that will be. So maybe we'll move this 2ux over and move the one over as well. That'll give us 2ux equals uh, u squared minus one, which tells us that x equals u squared minus one over two u, like that. But then finally, maybe we can simplify this a little bit. Notice that that is u over two minus one over two u, like that. That allows us to calculate the dx component, which will be important for our substitution. So that's gonna be equal to one half, and it'll be plus one over two u squared du where this step from here to here we found just by using the power rule for the derivative, thinking about this u in the denominator as being u to the minus one. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. So now we'll have this is equal to, well, the square root of one plus x squared. Well, that's gonna be u minus x, but we already know what x is given by this thing right here. So notice u minus x, we'll leave this u over two the same because we have a whole u minus a half u, but then this minus sign will turn into a plus. So let's maybe go ahead and write that down. We'll have u over two plus one over two u. So like I said, that's the square root of one plus x squared. Now we'll have our dx component, which is given by this thing down here. So here we'll have one half plus one over two u squared du, like that. Okay, so now we have changed everything from an integral having to do with x's to an integral having to do with u's. Next, I'll see that I have a two in the denominator everywhere. That means I can factor a one quarter out of the whole integral. I can factor a half out of this one and a half out of this one. That'll leave me with something that's a little bit easier to work with. So let's do that. We have a quarter and then we'll be left with u plus one over u. That'll be from the first term. And then one plus one over u squared. That'll be the second term. Now we can just multiply those out and we'll be left with objects that we have fairly simple antiderivatives of. So let's do that. That'll give us a one quarter out front and then we'll have the antiderivative of u plus two over u plus one over u cubed du. So I'll let you guys just check that if you foil that thing above out, that's what you end up with. Now we can take the appropriate antiderivatives using the power rule or using a natural log in this case. 
So that's gonna give us one quarter. And then we'll have, this term will turn into u squared over two. Um, this term will turn into two natural log absolute value of u. And then this term right here will be minus one over two u squared, like that. Now, let's go ahead and take this one quarter, multiply it through to this two term and to the other term, but we're gonna do that slightly differently. Okay, so the way that I wanna do that is take this, now we'll have one half natural log of the absolute value of u from that yellow distribution. And then next, I'll take this one over four and think of it as one over two times two and take the two onto each of those denominators while I leave the other two outside. So I'm gonna write that as plus one half u squared over four minus one over four u squared. And I'm gonna go ahead and add my constant right now. So you might say, well, why did I do that? And the reasoning is so that I could have a difference of squares here. So notice I have u over two quantity squared minus one over two u quantity squared there. So that's actually something nice that's easy to factor. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. We have one half natural log of absolute value of u plus one half. Now this is gonna be u over two plus one over two u, and then u over two minus one over two u plus c. Now we just have to work at putting this back in terms of x. So we know that u is equal to x plus square root of one plus x squared. So I can write this as one half natural log of the absolute value of x plus the square root of x squared plus one, like that, good. And then next I'll have this half, so I'll have plus one half. Now I have to work on these remaining terms right here. But we're actually in luck because those objects written in terms of x are actually essentially on the board right now. So notice that this guy right here is our x term. It also shows up here. And then if we rewrite our square root of one plus x squared term, just in terms of u, we will recognize that it's exactly equal to what's left over here. And we actually use that substitution at the very beginning, so that should be somewhat familiar. So we can write this as one half x times the square root of x squared plus one, and then we have plus our constant. So we've completed our first method of finding this antiderivative. And now let's move on to the second method, which is this hyperbolic substitution, which is maybe like a version of trigonometric substitution, but using hyperbolic trigonometric functions instead of normal trigonometric functions. So here we wanna set x equal to the hyperbolic sine of t. I'll use t as the variable here, but that's gonna make dx equal to the hyperbolic cosine of t dt just by our derivatives of hyperbolic functions. Next, we can check that the square root of one plus x squared will be equal to the hyperbolic cosine as well. And that's because we have this nice property that the hyperbolic cosine squared minus the hyperbolic sine squared is equal to one. So that's like the version of our Pythagorean identity but for hyperbolic functions instead of regular functions. So now we can put a little box around this and change our integral into an integral involving these guys right here. So notice, replacing the square root of one plus x squared will be a, a hyperbolic cosine, replacing the dx will be another hyperbolic cosine, so we can write this as the hyperbolic cosine squared t dt. Now there are actually a bunch of ways that we can go from here, but what I wanna do is maybe write the exponential definition of the hyperbolic cosine. That'll actually lead us towards a pretty simple integration from this point forward. So let's do that. So we can write this as e to the t plus e to the minus t over two quantity squared dt. So I've just replaced hyperbolic cosine with its exponential definition. Now let's go ahead and multiply that out. So a one fourth will come out front and we'll be left with e to the two t plus two plus e to the minus two t dt, like that. 
Okay, so again, that's just from foiling this and then recognizing that we're squaring this two in the denominator. But now we're set up to take antiderivatives pretty easily. This will give us one fourth. The antiderivative of e to the 2t will be 1 half e to the 2t. And then this guy right here will become 2t. And now we'll have minus 1 half e to the minus 2t. And then finally, we need plus a constant here. Okay, now I'm going to take this and rewrite it a little bit. I'll take this 1 quarter and multiply it through here to cancel the two to give us a one half in the denominator. So let's just go ahead and do that first. We have one half times t. And then I'll use the exact same trick I did in the last board of factoring this four into two times two, taking one of the twos and multiplying it through to the remaining terms. That's going to give me another difference of squares, but let's see how that happens. Now we'll have plus one half and then e to the 2t over 4 minus e to the minus 2t over 4. And then next we have a plus a constant out here. Next up, I want to recognize that this e to the 2t over 4 is really e to the t over 2 quantity squared. And likewise, this is e to the minus t over 2 quantity squared, meaning I can factor that like a difference of squares just like I did with the previous problem. So that's going to leave me with 1 half t plus 1 half e to the t over 2 plus e to the minus t over 2 times e to the t over 2 minus e to the minus t over 2 plus our constant. Next up, we can see that one of these is a hyperbolic cosine and one of these is a hyperbolic sine. In fact, this is hyperbolic cosine and this is hyperbolic sine. So that means I can write this as 1 half t and then I have plus 1 half. I'm going to put it in a slightly different order though. So, I, so hyperbolic sine of t, hyperbolic cosine of t plus our constant. Now, next up, I want to put everything back into x coordinates. And I can do this in the first place by replacing t with the inverse hyperbolic sine. So this is going to be inverse hyperbolic sine of x. And then I know hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine are x and square root of 1 plus x squared, respectively. So now I'll have plus 1 half x square root of x squared plus 1 plus a constant. So I got something that's slightly different than what I had on the last board. But as you'll see, we can rewrite this hyperbolic sine inverse in terms of a logarithm that would make these two look exactly the same. OK, so now we finished our second solution. And now we're ready to move on to our third and last solution. And that will involve this like classic trigonometric substitution, which is the standard method that would be taught in a Calculus 2 class. OK, looking at this square root of 1 plus x squared term, generally you're taught to substitute in this case with the tangent function. So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll set x equal to the tangent of theta. But then that means that the square root of 1 plus x squared is equal to the secant of theta using some trigonometric identities. And then dx will be equal to secant squared theta d theta. So again, that is from like some standard derivative rules involving tangent and some trig identities. So let's put a little box around that so that we have it. And now we can rewrite our given integral with these new coordinates. So now this is going to look like the integral of secant cubed of theta d theta. Now, I think the best way to tackle this is with integration by parts. And since there's probably a lot of videos that tackle this integral with integration by parts on YouTube, I'm going to do it in my performance method of splitting it up into things that cancel each other out, which I really like, although it's kind of a ridiculous method if you think about it. So I'm going to write this as 1 half and then the integral plus itself. So I'm going to take this. I'll write it as secant cubed 
theta, but I'll write this first secant cubed theta as secant theta times secant squared theta d theta. So clearly, if you multiply those, you get secant cubed theta. But then I'll take my second copy of that integral and just write it as secant cubed theta d theta. So I won't really expand that at all. Next up, I want to apply integration by parts to this first integral. And the motivation here is that the antiderivative of secant squared is fairly simple, so we can take advantage of that. So if we let dv be secant squared, then that means u would be secant, and we can calculate the rest of our parts. So du will be equal to secant theta tangent theta d theta by the derivative of secant, and then v will be equal to tangent theta, again by the antiderivative of secant squared. So let's see what that gives us. So now we'll have that this is one half, and then we'll use the standard integration by parts formula. So it will be u times v, so that's going to be secant theta times tangent theta minus the integral of v du. So let's see, that'll be this times this. So we'll have minus tangent squared theta times secant theta d theta. And then left over, we have this secant cubed theta. So let's write that down too. So secant cubed theta d theta, which just came from the previous step. We haven't done anything with that. So now is where the magic happens. We can take this tangent squared, and we can write the tangent squared as secant squared theta minus 1. But after doing that, multiplying the secant squared to the secant will give us a ne negative secant cubed, which will cancel out this secant cubed. So this is going to disappear with that, and we'll be left with minus negative 1 times secant theta. So let's go ahead and bring all of that down. So this is going to be equal to half. Now we have secant theta tangent theta and then plus the antiderivative of secant theta d theta. Great. And now we can finish it off. So the antiderivative of secant itself is a bit tricky. I'll let you guys look at all the multiple tricks for calculating that antiderivative. We'll just jump to its form. So let's see. Now we'll have 1 half. This secant theta tan theta will just come down. And then the antiderivative of secant is the natural log of the absolute value of secant theta plus tangent theta. We need to put our c as well. Next up, we need to turn this back into x coordinates. But luckily, we have the substitutions on the board as needed. So notice secant theta is the square root of 1 plus x squared. Tangent theta is x. So that means we can turn this into 1 half, and then it'll be x times the square root of x squared plus 1, and then plus the natural log of the absolute value of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1, which is in line with what we saw with the previous solutions. Okay, so that finishes this third solution, and that's a good place to stop.